So, this all went on for about six months, a little over a year and a half ago. I was working at this little gas station, about eight minutes from my house. Within the span of those six months, I was promoted from Delhi girl to cashier. But I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, when I was still busying myself with frying potato logs and dousing myself in chicken liver and blood, he made his first appearance. It wasn't his first time in the store, mind you. Just the first time that I had seen him. He honestly looked completely harmless, with his limp and his oxygen tank. All the women I worked with seemed fairly familiar with him and didn't pay him much mind. My boss lady told me that he was a bounty hunter and he couldn't have been less than 70, but he seemed nice enough. About a month went by and I had become fairly accustomed to seeing the man. They called him Lucky. Seriously, a 70-something year old man with an oxygen tank who couldn't have weighed more than 120 pounds and he was supposed to be Lucky? Oh well. So anyway, he showed up just like every weekend and made his way to the back of the store where I was presently bent inside the fryer scrubbing at the day's filth with some white vinegar. Hey, pretty lady. You look like you could use a stiff... drink. He belly laughed at his own nudity, and I rolled my eyes. Oh, shut it, Lucky. You know I'm not 21. Besides, I've got to tend to this shit, so I can go home. I have dogs to feed and a house to clean. I've never looked up from my place at the fryer. Such was our relationship. And yes, I often cuss my customers. You'd have to really go to this station to understand why, though. So, after a few more harmless teases, I tossed a few chicken strips left over from the day into a paper sack and carried them to him and the register. He thanked me and made his way out and picked up his truck to pump his typical $20 worth of gas. And I finished my fryer scrubbing. I decided to step outside for a quick smoke before I had to mop. So I grabbed my news ports and phone and headed for the door. I was mindlessly scrolling Twitter when I felt someone approaching me from the other side of the building. I looked up and it was good old Lucky standing to my left, smiling. Lucky, what the hell? What are you doing here? And about that time, a local cop that I was pretty good friends with came cruising up. And just like that, Lucky was gone. Over the next several months, Lucky's advances became increasingly worse. He would say terrible, vile things and just laugh like it was nothing. It went on a while, and he would say something gross and awful, and I would just cuss him. The peak came at the six month mark, and even though I know I was never truly in any danger, it still makes me cringe to this day. I was working double shift on the register, and had just finished stocking up all the cigarettes, when I decided it was time to enjoy one of my own. I stepped outside lit up and set about studying the chicken blood stains on my shoes. I glanced up just in time to see that little green pickup pulling into the pumps. I got that unusual nauseous feeling that I experienced every time I saw him, but decided I wasn't wasting three fourths of a cigarette for him. I planted my feet and continued my smoke. Mmm, you look especially grungy today. He was leering at me. I decided to not even acknowledge him. And I guess he didn't like giving up. So he continued with his bullshit. Your hair is getting so long. 
I wonder what the rest of your hair looks like, hmm? At that point, I was totally grossed out. Seriously, Lucky. If you don't piss off right now, I swear, I will rip your nuts off where they hang. Okay? Unfortunately, he wasn't deterred. Come on, baby. Just let me rub on your legs a little bit. When's the last time you shaved those pretty things, eh? I like them natural and furry. He laughed emphatically and winked at me. Piss off. I stubbed out my smoke and put it in the trash. This old Tom can still do a few tricks, if you know what I mean. Just let me take you to my home. You know, my doctor said I shouldn't have sex because I'm supposed to wear my tank at all times. But baby, I'd die just to get my hands on those legs. At that point, not only was I disgusted, but 100% fed the hell up. I squared my shoulders and looked him square in the eyes. Lucky, you listen here and you listen good. You have until about the count of five to take your nasty ass truck and get the hell away off this property. Otherwise, you're going to be losing two nuts and a whole lot of blood. You understand? Because I swear, before everything, that I will rip your eyeballs out from your asshole if you ever say one more thing to me. Are we clear? When he didn't say anything, I gathered up my bravado and began to count. One, two. At that moment, my boss lady came whimpering up in my car from her weekly appointment and quickly kicked Lucky off the property. Guaranteeing if he ever showed up again while I was there, he'd have a permanent restraining order put against him. Like I said, I don't know if I ever was in any real danger, as there was always a good group of people around. But still, it was a creeptastic experience, and I'm glad it's over. But with that being said, you never do truly know people, or their motives. If he seriously wanted me, how far would he have been willing to go? I think that's a question only a lot of us can assume, but none of us truly know. And it still terrifies me to think, if I hadn't have done something, would there have been a good chance I'd have been in danger? This story starts in the summer circa 1990, in a Dallas suburb. As a child, and still today, I was very whimsical and didn't pay much attention to anything that didn't concern me in that moment. It was a summer day, and I was playing in the backyard. My mom had to run some errands, so of course I stalled and waited till she was walking out of the front door, until I finally dragged ass to join her. Did you shut the sliding door? She asked. Not remembering or caring at all, I said yes and we went about our day. We arrived back home sometime early evening around six. As we enter the house, the sliding door is wide open. Of course my mum scolds me for not remembering, and me truly not remembering, apologise and go about my business. As the night winds down, my mum tucks me in and goes downstairs to run a bar. So like any five-year-old, the last thing I want to do is sleep. As I lay on my bed playing with micro-machines and making goofy kid noises, I feel my bed move slightly. I immediately pause and look around. I quickly dismiss it and go about my usual kid business. A few minutes later, the end of my bed lifts up and slams back down. Of course, I did what any five-year-old would do and screamed like a banshee. Then, in the dark room, my bed started moving and a shadow slowly tries to rise from the foot of my bed. I stood up an Olympic jumped all the way to the door and met my mum mid-stairs. As I hysterically tell my mum what happened, we run to the kitchen and call 911. 
We kept it short and ran to the car and waited outside for the police. As we wait, we see my upstairs light turn on, then the hallway, then the stairway. Then a minute later, we hear the police screeching in. They flew in the house and searched to no avail. They said that we probably walked in as the intruder was trying to rob the place, although nothing was touched or disturbed. Needless to say, I didn't sleep in my room for a month. And now every time I get home at night, I always turn on every light and check every crevice. Thanks a lot, you creepy burglar. I hope we do not meet again, because I would beat the shit out of you. I was born into the Jehovah's Witness cult, and spent the better part of 30 years involved with it. Though the last five years of that period was spent fading away. I'm not sure about the rest of the world, but here in the USA, the Jehovah's Witnesses are regarded as a fairly benign group, who are generally nice people, who may occasionally bug you on Saturday or Sunday mornings with their door-to-door -door proslighting, which is in fact a sales campaign for their magazines and other literature, as well as the means by which they garner new members. This is so far from the truth as to be frightening. This religion is nothing more than an Armageddon cult, led by an American publishing company, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. They are isolationists, requiring their members to have little to no association with worldly people. Basically, anyone who's not a Jehovah's Witness. They monopolize both the time and the money of their members to the point that there's really no time for anything beyond church functions, which range from a minimum of three meetings per week, which you are not to miss even if you're deathly ill, as they encourage you to call the Kingdom Hall and listen over the phone, and several hours of door-to-door -door witnessing to personal and family study. Members of the organization who have been disfellowshipped or excommunicated are to be shunned even by their closest friends and even immediate family members. And this arrangement is taught to be a form of love. Ex-Jehovah's Witnesses or anyone who questions any of the society's teachings are branded as apostates and are not to be associated with under any circumstances. Any information which contradicts the teachings of the Watchtower is considered apostasy and is strictly forbidden. Simply reading material regarding evolution or biology which isn't published by the Watchtower or reading a blog written by a former Jehovah's Witness is enough to have you cast out of the congregation and depending on your circumstances out of your home and away from your own family. Members may only become romantically involved with other members, and dating is not seen as a recreational activity, but as a sign that you are actively seeking a marriage partner. Dating a succession of people is heavily frowned upon. I've known many teenagers who were married almost immediately after turning 18, and in few instances, even earlier than that. And the only person they've ever dated is that person. Sex before marriage is of course forbidden and can get you expelled from the congregation. Arranged marriages aren't unheard of, but it's been many years since I knew of one happening. Perhaps the most alarming practices of the cult, beyond the absolute shunning of disfellowshipped and former members, are their policies regarding child abuse, sexual abuse and blood transfusions. If a child or any other member of a Jehovah's Witness is abused physically or sexually, the policy is to keep the authorities out of the situation and to handle the matter internally. 
This often results in the perpetrator of these crimes being allowed to roam the congregation freely, as if nothing ever happened. Many times, the victims of these crimes are blamed for what happened, especially in cases where husbands have abused their wives. Pedophiles are usually moved to another congregation, which, due to their confidentiality policy, has no idea they now possibly have another sexual predator in their midst. Blood transfusions are forbidden, even in circumstances where it is the only way to save a life. Members who, for whatever reason, require a blood transfusion may have blood fractions, but not whole blood. Countless members, including children, have died due to this policy. I don't know about you, but that's a whole lot of rules for getting into the kingdom of heaven. So I am now in my retirement days, as I spent 32 years as a firefighter, and I love to travel the world. But, anyway, one day when I was 22, I was travelling in Europe for a summer, and I was in Germany for a few days. Germany is such a fascinating place. But, anyways, I was in this village called Kocha. I was staying there with some friends and my soon-to-be wife. Well, we were eating at this pub, and I stepped outside to smoke my pipe that I had just bought when in Scotland. But I remember this story clear as day. It was almost dark and I just started getting my tobacco ready. I then walked around the building, to the back, puffing as I went, when I saw a glow coming from a wooded area, since there were still some lights out, enough so that I could see. So I decided to walk towards it. Big mistake. I then noticed it was a bonfire that someone had made with logs, tied with twine, like a rope and made it into a square on top of each other. I was already seen by a man with a big bushy beard and mid-length hair, who had a brown cloak on with a hood. He did not say anything to me, but knowing that I'd already seen it, and a bit awkward to go away at that point, I just stood next to him, puffing my pipe. I then said hello, and of course he didn't know English. He then said something in German, and I caught the end of it knowing very little. But what I was taught there is what I caught was the word backwards. He then started walking off, and I should have taken the time to walk away as well, but curiosity got the better of me. I waited till he returned with a man who had a black beard and was bald, and he spoke English, and asked me if I was here to undergo the joining whatever that meant. But I kindly declined. And he said, well, since you're here, I can't really let you leave without knowing who you are exactly. The guy next to him with the big brown beard that said something in German, and the guy with the black beard then asked me for some identification. Me being the worry wart, I thought it was a scam. So I just said I'd be on my way. The black beard guy, said no once more and told me that I could not leave until he knew for sure that I'd forget everything I saw there. I was confused and looked around but only saw the bonfire and then I noticed all the different skulls ranging from humans to cow hanging from trees. I was then officially freaked out and basically agreed to the threat and ran away like a pussy. But I then felt watched for the rest of my time in the village, and I decided it was time to move on from the village, when we were supposed to stay there another day. It was the creepiest moment of my life, and I do believe it was some sort of creepy secret society. I met a really pretty girl. Anyway, after a few nighttime hangouts, I was really into her. And after about two weeks, she asks me if I would be willing 
to go to this forum with her and her friend. It's not critical to this story, but I would like to point out that her friend was also an attractive redhead, and this was at least a subconscious factor in agreeing to go. She told me that they needed to bring at least two friends of them to the forum. A forum, huh? Sounded fun. Not threatening or awkward at all. I literally did not ask any follow-up questions about it. I just agreed to go. Did I mention she was very pretty? Well, it turned out to be something called the Landmark Forum. Some kind of cross between a motivational seminar and pop psychology self-awareness re-education. It was similar to the scene from the Jim Carrey film Yes Man, but the organisers and volunteers conducted much more audience participation. I'll describe the attendees. Many lost middle-aged dudes in Cosby sweaters, frumpy pantsuit ladies and thousands of yard stare types. You could read the hard luck stories on their faces. All of the enthusiastic hip young people were almost certainly paid actors whose job it was to hype up the motivational proportion of the forum. About 15 minutes into the program I had my I immediately regret this decision moment. Oh shit. I'm in a cult meeting. What the hell am I doing here? I am now one of those people who has been to a cult meeting. Please God, don't let me run into anyone who knows me. I'll just smile and play along and I'll get the hell out of here the first opportunity I get. The forum was just kind of full of cliches. Help self motivation hype and such. New agey stuff about breakthrough emotional barriers and confronting self-truths and achieving what you want. A particularly cringy part was the interactive portions where I was supposed to tell a hype man with an infomercial British accent a bunch of personal information. He got really impatient with me because I was not widely agreeing with what he said and I was being evasive in my answers. My only real thought was, how can I get out of this and not offend the pretty girl? So they broke us up into smaller groups, sending us all into small rooms for more focused attention. So now I'm in a small room with a frumpy Cosby sweater freak, and not the girl. Yeah, she'd already done this portion of the re-education. I'm on my own now. They had me fill out a form with a list of my very personal information and I promptly completed it with a fake and imaginary name as well as fake everything else. Only my first real name as they already knew that. If you live at 10101 Bonkers Street in Anchorage, Alaska, I'm sorry for all the mail that must have been going to your house from these people. It was then time for the emotional testimonials from people who had completed the program. I recall the odd thing was that people giving the testimonials seemed tired or sad even as they spoke about how the program helped them. The way recovering addicts talked about hitting bottom and recovery. It looked joyless. The hype men bought out their board markers and went over the aspects of Landmark Breakthrough's teachings. Then the confrontation began. They wanted us to participate by discussing personal conflict that we break through together, right here in this room, now. Nope. It was about that moment that I decided, you know what, me and this girl aren't ever gonna get anywhere. I mean, I never really wanted to try with a crazy anyway. I told them thanks for the day old donuts and the crazy and see you never. They seemed cool with it, which I can only attribute to some kidnapping lawsuit that meant that they could not keep people in a room against their will. However, they just moved me to a different room by myself 
to wait until the program was over, when I could be reunited with my pretty crazy girl acquaintance. Now I'm getting creeped out. I don't know this building or this area very well, and I'm in a windowless room. I was there for about half hour. When this hype man comes in and want to discuss my answers on the form I filled out, because my answers were all imaginary baloney. This was the most awkward conversation I've ever had, bar none. I was discussing imaginary problems with a cult hype man. He was explaining how Landmark could help me and how I was resisting. And I was actually explaining why the program was not for me and my imaginary problems. I needed to take my imaginary problems somewhere else, like an imaginary location, perhaps Never Neverland or Sesame Street. I'm an idiot. At this point, I'm totally crawling out of my skin. I gotta go now, I told him, which was fine, but he asked me not to discuss what went on in the program with the media. No problem, because I'll never admit that I even went to this forum. Because this is what happens when you go into a cult after chasing after a girl. Oh, about that girl? We lost contact and grew apart immediately. When I was around eight or so, my mum joined a cult. And I guess I came along with her. My dad was totally out of the picture. He lived halfway across the country and only saw me in person a dozen times a year. We lived in Arizona. They had this ranch type place out in the middle of the desert, at least a day's drive from anywhere. It wasn't much, a few old wooden houses and a well. Anyway, me and some other kids whose parents were in the cult went there for summer one year, and it was pretty weird. They were a sort of sect of Christianity. They believed in God, but had some other crazy stuff. They hated technology. One kid bought his phone, and one of the custodians, the guy who looked after us and observed us all day, took it, threw it on the ground, and proceeded to stamp on it until it was broken. One other thing was that they were sort of white supremacists. While we were all white, there were no other ethnicities there. And they always talked about how God had chosen whites to be the rulers of the earth, and how all other beings were inferior. I think they were creationists too. They never really said much about it, but I remember them yelling at some kid for saying something about it. Darwin. We pretty much only ate bread and water, and they hated processed anything, as a result of the technophobia. Whenever they let us go back to town, not only were we watched at all times by our custodian, but if you tried to buy something they didn't like, when they searched you going back to camp, they destroyed it and punished you. Mostly our days consisted of waking up really early, running around the camp for a while, having a lovely breakfast of dry bread and barely enough water to keep us going, long lessons about God, the Bible, and how modern day society is evil. It was a really authoritarian regime. You weren't even allowed to question the custodians. You couldn't do anything without their permission. They beat up kids sometimes. And keep in mind, the kids were around 9 to 13, and the custodians were in their late teens or early 20s. Thankfully, shortly afterwards, my mum got out of it and moved away. I heard they tried contacting her, but she managed to cut them off. They got shut down a few years afterwards. Apparently, one of the custodians molested a kid, and they all helped cover it up. Sick bastards. When I first qualified as a nurse about seven years ago, my first job was working in the operating theatre of a large old hospital. I was doing a run of night shifts 
and there we ran just one emergency theatre overnight. And you would often be able to have long breaks to get some sleep. The department had a large basement full of winding corridors and rooms where we kept the endless equipment needed for all the surgeries. There was also a very large staff room in the basement full of comfortable couches. It was my last shift and I was feeling a bit tired so I headed down there for my break. I don't usually sleep on nights so this was the first time in there at night. All the other nurses said that they were going to stay on the main floor and sleep in the recovery room which I thought was odd. I settled down but couldn't sleep as usual. So I was texting the girl I was seeing at the time, facing the back of the couch, when I suddenly felt a very angry slap on the back. I screamed out loud because I didn't think anyone was in there in the room with me. I jumped up, slammed on the light, and it was empty. I grabbed my stuff and ran out the room, through the winding dark corridors, up the stairs, and out into the sanctuary of the recovery room. I must have looked as white as a sheet. Someone asked if I was okay, and I said what happened, and swore it was true. There was no way I was asleep. An older nurse smiles and said, You met him, didn't you? She explains how years ago, a not very nice man who did the inventory had a heart attack and passed away down there, alone in the staff room. Ever since then, people kept experiencing angry events, like the sensations of being smothered, pushed or slapped, if lying down there at night. That was why... Most staff didn't sleep down there at night. I never went back there in the staff room for the entire time I worked there, unless it was in a day with a colleague. Three years ago, I thought I joined an amazing church. I was never a Jesus freak. In fact, I used to make fun of them and referred to anyone who was when I was younger as a Bible basher. During college though, that changed. I felt the need to reform a relationship with God after the deaths of close family members. It couldn't have been better timing because I ended up at a new school and a new job where I eventually met Joanna. Joanna was an instant friend. We clicked right away. We shared a passion for music, and we were studying the same major, and could talk for hours about anything. Joanna and I hung out for about six months before I started to notice anything out of the ordinary. Basically, I would never see her on weekends because she told me she devoted them to her church and youth group. I didn't think that was strange, but I was curious and asked her what religion she was. She said she was non-denominational, then quickly changed the subject. Joanna started showing up to work less and less, and she started missing classes. She was always tired when she did show up, or looked completely drained and out of it. Rumours around school and work were that she was on drugs. I knew that was false, because we both had a disdain for drugs, and others who partied hard like that. Joanna had less and less time to spend with friends, so I would rarely see her. And after about a month like this, she called me out of the blue to go out to Denny's. We met up and she pulled out her phone. She showed me a YouTube video of a recent volunteer activity she did with the church group. Joanna explained to me that she volunteered a lot at her church and it took up a lot of her time. The video quality was excellent for a church video and it played almost like a short film. The passion she had been talking about, all the good deeds they did, piqued my interest. I asked her the name of her church. Again, she didn't disclose, but said it was non-denominational Christian. She asked me to come with her right now 
because it was better that I see it for myself. I found it strange, because it was 10pm at night on a Wednesday. I went into a small office warehouse looking building, and found it strange that a church wouldn't have any signs or any pictures of Jesus in the space. It looked like a child's daycare or nursing centre. Immediately women rushed over and hugged me. It was unreal. I later learned I got love bombarded, and before I knew it, I was sitting in a corner of a room with a woman slightly older and Joanna. She had a dry erase board and started teaching me about the Bible. The Bible study made sense, but soon after she asked me if I was ready to be baptised, it was 11.30, and I now felt some sort of obligation. I had no right home, and had no idea where I was. And these happy, shiny people were cooking for me and teaching me about the Bible. How could I say no? I was hesitant, but the intensity grew, and I could feel the attitude start to change to desperation. They promised it would only take a few minutes, and that God was watching, and that I may die if I deny being baptised after learning the truth. So like an idiot, I agreed and was rushed into a bathroom to get changed into a white robe. When I let them know I had changed, they ushered me into a bathtub, where a small Asian man walked in. Apparently he was a pastor. He told me not to be nervous, and that the water would be warm. I knelt in the shower with the lights dimmed, while the rest of the women came in wearing veils over their heads, singing in some strange monotone voices. I heard him baptise me in the name of an Asian god, and that's when I freaked out. Once I left, I was baffled and nervous. It was such an intense feeling. I was still stuck there and Joanna had driven me out there and it felt like another country, and I had no idea how to leave. They made me more food and later told me that my name, I was baptised under, would later be explained to me when I returned to study more. Everyone kept telling me how I was now part of the family, and I ended up returning and being brainwashed pretty heavily by this group, to the point where I felt like they were my family. I did things I'm not proud of. I helped recruit people, and spent hours and days and weeks there. Eventually, I found out that Joanna was just a recruiter, which I would soon turn out to be. Someone who just forms fake friendships to bring more young women into the group. I escaped, mentally, and deprogrammed and defellowshipped. It was a truly haunting experience that no young female should go through. I still see Joanna from time to time, with her victorious wolf pack preaching to women on campus and moors. I usually hide or run the other way. I hope never to bump into Joanna again. I am 22, and this incident happened a year and a half ago. I had just moved into my first apartment, and was in the process of moving in. The door that led into my apartment locks itself automatically when closed. So I was going to the entrance of the apartment complex to get my mail while talking on the phone with my boyfriend. I returned to my apartment and sat on the bed while opening the mail whilst using the phone. I dropped the phone on the floor and it landed under the bed. So I had to lie on the floor and stretch for it. I saw something that caught my eye. There was someone under my bed. My eyes widened, and I choked the urge to scream. The person laying under my bed was lying with his back towards me, and his head in his chest, so I couldn't see his face, and he didn't see me. Trying to be rational while so many thoughts rushed through my head, I picked up the phone and said, Sorry. I dropped my phone. I'm just going to have to take a shower and call you back. The bathroom is right by my bed. So I hastily walk in, quietly locked the door, turned the shower on, and jumped out my window, as my apartment is on the first floor, and I called the police. 
but to go across the street and see if anyone comes out the door of the apartment complex. This was during summer, and it was still light out. I placed myself across the street, hiding behind a car whilst watching my open bathroom window and the entry door. I called my boyfriend, and he came to me just before the police. I gave them my keys and they went inside. Only moments later, two cops came out holding a thin and very tired looking man. His eyes looked crazy, but he didn't try to get away. The policeman that had stood beside me and comforted me while the police searched through the house. I was a mess, shivering and crying. He told me that the man stood outside my bathroom door with one of my kitchen knives waiting for me to come out. The man had somehow crept into my entry door while I was getting my mail and hid under the bed. The man that was trying to hurt me turned out to be a homeless person and was placed in a mental hospital. My boyfriend moved in with me the very next day. This isn't my own story, but my atheist, non-spiritual, cynical best friend's afterlife story. To know this kid, and to have him tell this story whilst he's visibly trembling, scared the living shit out of me. And still does. He moved into his grandfather's house a few years ago, so that he could take care of him since his grandfather was frail and sadly dying of cancer. One night, after his grandfather had come and taken a turn for the worse, my friend was sitting in the living room, watching whatever comes on basic cable at 2am. He didn't get home from work until around midnight every night, and he heard a loud crash coming from his grandfather's bedroom. Thinking, that his grandfather had fallen out of bed again. He ran down the hall, opened the door, and saw his grandfather was still in bed. But with his back turned towards the door and his right arm reaching for something in the far corner of the bedroom. That's when my friend saw sparks floating in and out of the wall and ceiling. He watched for about three or four minutes. His grandfather's arm went back down and the sparks disappeared through the right wall. My friend closed the bedroom door, thinking that he was completely losing his mind and hallucinating, and sat back down in the living room. The next morning he was sitting at the kitchen table eating breakfast, when his grandfather sat down with him over oatmeal and they were both just sitting there eating in silence. My friend said, Hey, Pop, I heard some loud crashing noises coming from your room last night. Was everything all right? His grandfather immediately said, You saw them? Then went on about how his dead brother, cousin, and some other dead family members came to take him away. But he was telling them that he wasn't ready to go and that they needed to go away, and some other stuff that I can't remember. His grandfather died about a month later. He told me this story a couple of days after it happened, and I've heard him say it a few times since. It never changes. When I was seven, my mum hired a babysitter during the summer because she and my dad both worked full-time jobs. They loved work, and neither of them wanted to take part-time hours. So they hired Leia, and I absolutely loved her. She was like the big sister I never had, and I told her all of my secrets and crushes on the boys at school. My brother, who was nine, liked her as well, and the three of us, spent summer days under the ridiculously hot Canadian sun and ate popsicles by the box. One time, 
Leia took us for a ride on our bikes around the neighbourhood, down the old dirt path, to the gate that led to the horse farm turned dog daycare, and back to the house. The ride only took about ten minutes, and was enough to settle us down, being hyperactive, almost not quite preteens. She locked the front door, but left the sliding back door unlocked, because the thick wooden fence was six feet high, and there was no gate to get into the backyard. It didn't matter. When I was little, the area we lived in was quite newly developed, and had non-existent crime rates. So, we biked back and put our bikes in the front yard, walked up to the porch and into the house. Leia looked really nervous, and when I asked what was wrong, she just smiled and said nothing. Austin and I started raiding the pantry in search of delicious, all-holy dunkaroos, or God forbid, fruit roll-ups, heavenly sweet Jesus. Leah was back to being doe-eyed and cheerled and knelt down in front of me. We're going to play a little game, okay? she told me. I was just so excited. I probably was this close to peeing myself. Leah handed me a paring knife. Not a huge one, but just enough to fit into my hand. She told me that they were explorer swords, and she made us promise not to run or stab each other. She got the bigger knife, and the three of us explored the house. In my mum's room, some of her clothes were on the floor. Thinking back on it, that should have been the first red flag, because both my parents are absolute neat freaks. She once had a breakdown because my aunt decolor coded her bookshelf. Anyway, we kept moving through the house, opening closets and looking under beds. We made it to the garage, which was the only kind of messy room in the house besides Austin's. Leah walked further into the garage before she suddenly stopped. Nothing in here, guys. I told you that it was just the wind that opened the door. She said this. Before my big mouth could correct her, she grabbed me and pretty much dragged us upstairs while saying something like, let's go, or we'll be late for swimming, okay? We all walked out of the house and across the street to my father's military friend's house. Leah sat me and Austin in front of the PlayStation and walked into another room with my dad's friend. We sat there playing games until my parents came home, and for some reason, Leah wouldn't let me or Austin leave the rec room. Far away from the windows and constantly under the watch of military guy's wife. Then my parents picked us up and we went home and everything was fine. I forgot about it until last year when I was 14, and I asked Leia, as we stayed friends as she's my mother's friend's daughter, what happened with all of that? And she told me what really happened. The back door was open when we got back, and it wasn't the wind, because it was a sliding porch door. While we were playing Explorer, in the garage, she had gone towards the family's rowboat, and saw a guy crouching under it holding a weirdly shaped knife. He wasn't facing her, so she played dumb and got us the hell out of there. Then she told the military guy what had happened, and he went over to our house with one of his guns and went to the garage to check it out. He found the guy in the midst of the escape, and there was a tussle before this crazy dude got out and scaled the fence into the bushes and got away. His backpack had hit the fence though, and split on a nail, and he dropped several things, including a weird sort of nightstick with a small rabbit-sized belt tied around it, a few weird Polaroid photos of blurry rooms and porn mags, not regular porn mags though, and there was a picture of naked kids in there. Children, our age or younger. They called the police, but the guy was never found. Anyway, creepy, pedophilic, child-stalking house-enterer? 
I hope your stupid ass tripped on a tree branch and it hit you in the head and you died. Let's never meet again. I live in Alaska. And one of the first school shootings pre-Columbine was in Bethel. We were in the same region for sports, so we would have to travel there. Now, you must understand that as most towns are relatively isolated, the only way to get to and from each would be via plane. When we played games against other teams, we used to generally just sleep in their school, as the distance was a lot. So anyway, we were quite spooked because we were at the school in Bethel. Mostly because a 15 year old student named Josh that played basketball was killed. He was older than me, but played ball at the same time as my older sister. And I knew what he looked like. Late one night, our team was playing hide and seek. I was hiding in the common area where there is a phone, elevator, and it has a library overlooking it. I was hiding behind a table and saw a reflection in the glass wall that goes outside. I thought it was one of my teammates because it looked like a blue and gold practice warm up get out gear from the corner of my eye. I went around the corner and there in the glass, I saw Josh in his blue and yellow warm-up gear, which is Bethel's colours and coincidentally, our colours too. I screamed and ran and told everyone and immediately quit playing. I made one of my teammates come with me to use the payphone that was in the common area where I had just seen the reflection. I picked up the phone, dialed connect, said my name and was hearing it ring. I turned around to lean on the wall the payphone was on and in turn was looking out the window glass door that I had seen the reflection in earlier. The phone finally stopped ringing and it sounded like someone had answered. I shit you not. On the other end someone said, quit staring at me. I didn't stop to hear if he was going to say anything else. I dropped the phone and ran with my teammates chasing after me. Still gives me the creeps to this day. When I was about 12 or 13, my family had a cabin in northern Minnesota. The extended family gets together almost every weekend in the summer on their perspective plots and all next to each other in what turns into a big wild compound. But on either side of this stretch of family cabins, we have the neighbours. One weekend, the neighbours on to the west were having a big wedding reception on their land. Tons of people, kids, family and fun. I might get this detail wrong, but I believe the brother to the groom in any case the son of the owner's cabin, was water skiing and showing off having fun. He was coming in real close on a couple of turns to spray the people on the dock, and as he came to spray the bride, he slammed into the back of one of the docked boats, crushed his chest cavity. I was playing volleyball at my grandpa's cabin, and I will never forget the sound. Everything stopped. I'm sure the whole lake heard it, and the cries of the onlookers. Long story short, the kid died in a helicopter on the way to the hospital. Tragic. Now about a month later, I'm back up at my grandpa's cabin. It's night time, and we were watching a movie. Well, trying to. The TV was on and literally flipping channels and making white noise. Several adults are around and we're trying to figure out what this thing is. As we turn the TV off, the sound continues 
and we realize immediately it's not the TV, but some white noise coming from outside, changing frequencies, kind of oscillating. The adult grabs flashlights, and we all head outside, and we realize it's coming from the west a bit. At this point, the sound is clearer. Music, static, music, static. And we follow the sound, but soon find that it's coming from our neighbors to the west dock. In fact, the boat, completely secure, with dry boat cover and firmly on, and is the boat that the kid had crashed into just a week before. The radio is on flipping channels, just like the TV. Coincidence? Possibly. But still. I am a female, and I was 16 when this happened years ago. There were two incidents that happened before the really scary one. We lived in a fairly new residential neighborhood, and one night, at about 10 p.m., I was laying in bed doing homework, and I hear this tapping and scratching sound at my window. My mother wasn't home that night, and my father was already asleep. I jumped out of my bed and ran into his room and said, Dad, someone's tapping on my window. My dad, who thought I was being a hysterical teenager, peeked out of his own window and said, Eh, it was probably a tree branch or something. He then went back to bed. My father was a lazy bastard. He couldn't even be bothered to go look out of my window or outside. Never mind the fact that there were no bushes nor trees near enough to touch my window. I was creeped out, but I double checked no one could see in my bedroom and that the curtains covered everything and went back. A few weeks later, I am sitting in the living room. It's just me and my mum home. I just finished taking a shower and was lounging in a towel while talking to my mum and painting my toenails. Suddenly, we both heard a tapping and scratching noise at the side window. My mum was pissed. She immediately jumped up and went outside where she confronted a man and the man walked off. She ran into the house and called the police. The police came and they caught the guy a few blocks away and my mom identified him as the man who was peeking in the window. The man claimed that he was just back there between the two houses because he had to take a leak. The police said, okay, so if you took a leak, where's the urine? And there was none. He was hauled off to jail for trespassing. I'm not sure if he was charged with being a peeping Tom or not. But anyway, fast forward about one month later, and I woke up in the middle of the night because my cat suddenly jumped off the bed. I heard a slight noise in the hallway, and I tipped toad to my bedroom door and peeked out, and there he was. The man who had been peeking. I could hear the thump and my heart was racing. The moment I saw him, he was standing in the doorway of my little sister's room with a gun in his hand. And he was starting to get closer and closer to the door. He had a gun in one hand and a bag in the other. That wasn't the room he wanted. I was sure I was about to die a horrible death after being raped. I've never, ever had such a big adrenaline rush in my life. Not even years later when I jumped out of a perfectly good airplane to skydive a few times. I was suddenly and powerfully alert. I'm telling you that I had super strength, hearing and sight. It might have been my imagination, but I swear I could see, hear and smell a lot better than normal because of the effect of adrenaline. 
and within a few seconds I was considering my options. I could scream, but he had a gun. My father would come running and get shot. I could hide in the closet or under the bed, but he'd find me. I could try and fight him, but he had a gun. This was before cell phones, and I didn't have a phone in my room. So, without any hesitation, I quickly opened up my window and jumped out, barefoot onto the gravel. I'm the kind of girl with zero upper body strength, and yet, I was able to get up and out of that window, quickly and quietly, with hardly any effort. Landing on the gravel in bare feet didn't even hurt a tiny bit. Did I mention that I was completely nude? Yeah, I slept in the nude. What can I say? It was summer and warm. I ran balls out about three houses down to a neighbor's house and banged on the door. Let me tell you, as a 16 year old girl, the thought of anyone seeing you naked is horrifying beyond belief. But in that moment, I didn't care for a second. I went three houses down because I didn't want the creepy man to hear me banging on a door. When I didn't get an immediate response, I went to the next house and banged on their door. This whole time, I was terrified for my family in my house. Finally, someone at the house answered the door and I just quickly said, there's a man in my house, call the police. They dialed 911 and the police were there fast. They came in without lights and sirens, and they caught the guy in my room. This is what he bought with him. A gun. A bag containing a rape kit. That included rope, tape, two exacto knives, a couple of dildos, bondage porn magazines, bleach, condoms, lube, ball gag, pliers, and a handful of other stuff that I'm sure would have made most people's skin crawl. Luckily, it never went to court. He did a plea bargain and got 25 years to life for a whole slew of charges. He's still in prison and will be for the rest of his life because a few years after getting to jail, he got a life sentence for committing murder while inside of prison. The DA who had handled my case called me to let me know. Thank God. I didn't sleep well again for a number of years. I would wake up at multiple times during the night at the slightest noise of provocation. It wasn't until I got a dog that I was able to sleep. And I let my dog do his job of warning me of any noise. And now I can sleep. It didn't hurt that I also got a gun and kept it near me when I slept. I took a gun safety class, lessons, and I go to the range every month without fail. I swear, I will kill anyone who tries to break into my house because I'm not taking any more chances. About two years ago, my buddy decided to go on a drive. We went together. It was a hot summer's night and we were bored out of our minds. So we picked up some cigarettes and went on a late night drive. We decided to drive to the top of a mountain. This is in Norway, by the way. It was pretty late, around 3 a.m. And we knew the bar would be closed but we thought we would just chill on the benches, have a smoke and take in the view at first light. So we get to the base of the mountain and start driving up and around. The road twists around the mountain until you get to the top. So where you can make a turn, you can barely see around the corner. It was pitch black darkness. Only the road was visible due to the street lights. But apart from the road, the edges and mountains were barely visible. We had been driving for almost half an hour and everything was pretty enjoyable. Absolutely empty roads as we guess everyone else is in bed. 
and I woke up ready to go to work in the morning. Complete silence. It was just relaxing. As we turn on the bends, I get this very uneasy feeling and see something. Definitely a person sitting on a boulder at the edge of the road. My father sees the man as well. And because it's pretty Tetris traversing the coal, we slowly head back and realize that he was fine. He's not getting any more bandages, was the feeling that he was going for. The figure then looks up in our direction as we get the shit out of there. Then we saw it was a woman wearing a plain white dress with very long black beautiful hair who didn't wear a smile on her face. I swear to God, we both felt so fearful that we were completely paralyzed. We couldn't yell or even communicate, not even a single word. It felt like we couldn't move. I don't know how he found the courage to press the gas and get the hell out of there. But I do remember that we both got home with a very high fever and we were like that for a few more days afterwards. I lived in a Victorian mansion turned into apartments, built in the late 1800s and haunted by a guy named Cap. Here are a few stories. I would smell cigar sometimes on the first floor and was pissed because it was a non-smoking apartment building. I didn't know this at the time, but cigar smell in that particular area was normal. It was a common sighting area for Cap. The smell continued even after new tenants moved in. So I know it wasn't sneaky tenants. Another time, my husband's best friend was sleeping on the couch. At around three in the morning, I woke up to footsteps going down the hall. I assumed he was coming back from the bathroom and went to sleep. The next morning, he asked us why we were walking around the apartment at 3 a.m. He thought they were our footsteps. My neighbor is very particular about his shoes and arranges them just so. He and his wife heard footsteps around their bed and when they stopped, he turned on the light and found his shoes scattered across the room. I don't think Cap liked those two very much. And this is my most direct contact. I was pregnant and having some bad tendinitis in my left hand, exasperated by pregnancy swelling. I am a flutist and couldn't play three notes in a row without issue. So naturally, I was trying to work out the kinks by practicing troublesome combinations, got frustrated and began cussing up a storm and holding back tears. Suddenly, I hear a male whisper from someone standing next to me. It's going to be okay. I searched the room in the apartment, and there was no one there. As terrifying as it was, it was still oddly comforting. I moved out a couple of years later when we bought a house, but I still kind of miss the place. I lived in a very ghetto apartment complex for somewhat most of my childhood. When I was 10, my family lost their house and had no choice but to move to these apartments. So. It was the majority of the worst experiences of my life that took them. We didn't move anywhere better until I was about 15 or 16. These apartments were on a horrible side of town 
with a very odd layout. There were so many apartments, it felt like its own big community gated away with a very cheap gate that never worked. My apartment was in the middle area, by the laundry building and the community park. My friend at the time lived on the far right side closest to the pool area. My mum never let me go beyond the pool area or past the park, and I wasn't allowed to go into anyone's apartment unless my mum could see the apartment from our building. I also wasn't allowed to be out past 10 p.m. Not because of my mum's worrying, but it was the apartment's rule that no children could be seen out past 10 without an adult around. I constantly lost track of time and would get scolded for being out too late. My dad said next time I'd have to wait and sleep outside. The week of my friend's birthday, we were out by the park, and she, as usual, was begging for me to go over to her apartment. She's younger than me, so I always saw her as the little sister I never had. I always promised her I'd go, but I never did. I knew she lived far. But since her birthday was coming up, I felt a little guilty. She gave me that puppy dog look, and I gave in. I was regretting it right away, once I realised I was getting close to 9pm, and she lived on the far right way past the pool area. I wanted to change my mind, but I already said yes, so I felt I had to commit to my decision. I paid attention as she guided me to her building since I had never been that far into the apartments and wanted to remember which turns to make it back home. There's a lot of narrow halls, turns and units to every section. It's literally a maze and very easy to get lost. I would be lying if I said I wasn't a bit freaked out, that I was going past my limit in the dark, knowing full well I have to eventually go back alone in total darkness, since there isn't many light posts around. We make it to her apartment on the second floor, where her mother gives me a warm welcome. My friend instantly pulled me into her room, extremely excited to show me all her dolls and toys. Looking around her place, I realised that she was an only child. I never bothered to ask in my head, and I just foolishly assumed everyone had siblings. Don't ask me why, that's just what I thought. No wonder she was so eager to have me over. She must have been lonely. I looked over at her mum, who was watching us, and she seemed really happy to see her daughter this excited. I looked at the time, and figured I could play for a few minutes, and then leave. Unsurprisingly, I lost track of time once again, and when I looked back at the clock, it was 9.40. I jumped up and told her I had to go home right away. She looked sad, so sad, and started to pull on my t-shirt telling me to stay. Her mother saw the anxiousness on my face and calmed her daughter down, explaining to her that it was late and that my parents needed me. She relaxed, let go of my hand, and I thanked her and bolted out the door. I ran down the stairs like my life depended on it, and once I made it down I stopped dead in my tracks. In front of her apartment is a circle patch of grass, and at the opposite end is a black old-fashioned light post. Next to it, was this tall, skinny guy, dressed in a long black coat, with a black hat and shades on. I remember squinting my eyes, because I couldn't believe how damn tall he was. At first, I thought I was seeing two light posts, until he took one big step towards me. My eyes widened, once I realised he was an actual person, and the more I stared, 
the more questions started to fly in my head. Like, why is he dressed so strangely? How tall he was? Why he was wearing black shades at night? Why did he take a big step towards me? I took a big breath and started walking towards the dark hallway area. That's where I had to go in order to start making my way home. I'm on full alert mode, and my ears are picking up every little sound as I'm making more turns into other halls, and then I hear it. Light footsteps behind me. I dreaded the idea of looking back, but I had to satisfy my curiosity. I slowly turned my head, but kept walking forwards, and of course he was following me. It was very dark, but I could see a tall figure walking my way. There wasn't much of his face showing other than his pointy nose, small mouth and extremely pale skin. I looked back and nearly ran into a wall. I decided I was going to run the rest of the way home. I know I have a chance to make it on time, and the last thing I wanted was to sleep outside with this creep following me. I start running, and I hear him running too. Just knowing he's running towards me sends a rush of fear and adrenaline to my head. All I hear is ringing in my ears, and I feel my heart ready to come out of my chest. I have asthma, so I could feel and barely hear myself making that gross wheezing sound. I honestly don't understand how my body handled running at all. You'd be surprised what your body can do when you feel like you are in absolute danger. I got to this grassy hill area, and I know that once I go down the hill, my apartment would literally be at the bottom of it. I focus all the energy I have left, and run all the way up that hill. Just before getting up though, I feel a hand grab the back of my shirt. I instinctively kicked right away, and actually managed to get him straight in the balls. He let me go, and I bolted up the hill, and basically toppled the way down. My dad was angrily waiting on the other side and just glared at me as I went inside with my head down. I didn't bother to explain myself, since everything I said was never true to them. I shared a room with my older brother, so I came into the room and collapsed on my bed. My brother was so into his games, I didn't think he realised the complete fear in my face. I couldn't sleep, because I was afraid to see him outside, since my bed was right by the window. But I would at least be comforted by the fact that my brother was on the side of the room, and he's six foot four with a big body frame, making me feel a bit protected. Before attempting to sleep, I peeked nervously out the window, and I could see a tall black shadow at the top of the hill. I couldn't tell if he was looking straight at me, or if he was trying to look for which building I'd got into, but I just hoped he didn't know which building was mine. Thankfully, nothing else ever happened that night. I didn't ever pass my boundaries again especially when staying out late, and I never stayed out after six. I also didn't go out for a couple of days, because I was paranoid, thinking that he would just be waiting outside my house, as I thought he might know where I lived. Definitely not someone I'd ever want to meet again. I worked for a company that provides patrol service in Portland, Oregon. Since I've recently left that company, I've decided to share some stories from my time working there. In between responding to calls for service, we would provide lock-up services for clients. That means we would show up and lock the offices, gates, pools, or whatever they wanted locked. On this particular night, I had been on the job for only a few months. I was in a very affluent area called Lake Oswego, performing a property patrol on one of the many apartment complexes there. Well, this specific apartment had a pool house 
that they liked us to lock up after 1am. It was about 12.45, so I decided to lock up early since I was leaving the area after patrol. I go inside and sweep the pool house, and it looks like it does every day. Nothing particularly out in the ordinary. I had always gotten creepy vibes inside the pool house though. I never felt as if I was alone, and I'd always encounter cold spots. My supervisor reported having the same issue on several occasions. Anyhow, everything looks business as usual. There is no water outside on the tub, and no spare towels left lying around. The chairs and tables are all in order. I go and check the side and find it secure. I go back to secure the main door, and as I'm doing so I hear water move. Then I hear two quick, wet footsteps, like wet sock squishes when you walk in them, and felt something tap my shoulder. I jumped and turned around, with all the crap scared out of me, because I thought I was alone, and there was nobody there. All I saw were two fresh prints of bare feet on the concrete floor. Throughout the following months, I told my story to the residents and showed them the picture I took. I had a few that reported similar instances of things happening to them. One resident said that on one occasion he was drying off after getting out of the hot tub on a late night. He was alone in the pool house, when suddenly there was a huge splash in the pool, as if somebody had jumped in. But he was alone and had no idea who caused it. I personally didn't have any issues after that, besides the feeling of being watched and cold spots in the poor house. Definitely one of the spookiest things that has ever happened to me. Last January, I celebrated my birthday. It didn't go too well. I was playing some computer games alone in my apartment. That would mean I'd stay up late at night gaming. I was so bored that time, because my friends were out of town, and then it was midnight. I was like, hooray, happy birthday to me. So I ate pizza and drank some juice. All that delicious introvert stuff. And then the phone rang. I thought it would be my friends calling to greet me because it's my birthday. But who calls late at night? I hesitated, but still I answered it. I heard a girl and a man speaking, and I didn't recognize the voice. I asked them who they were, and told them that they may have been calling the wrong person. It sounded like the girl took the phone away from the man and answered me. She told me that they knew me, and that they were looking at me right now through the window. The girl sounded very drunk because she was giggling. I was like, what the hell? I don't remember giving any strangers my number, but anyway. I hung up and continued playing some computer games. And after a few minutes, the phone rang again. So I answered and told them to stop messing with me. And after that, I stood up from my desk and went to look at the window. I didn't see anyone. I tried to look carefully, and I even used my cell phone to zoom in on some other buildings, but I found none. I started to believe it was a prank call, and then it rang again. I picked the phone up, but I didn't speak. On the other line, they weren't speaking either. It was like they were waiting for me to go first. So I started to ask them what was their problem. The girl then told me that they were outside my apartment, waiting for me to open the door. Now I was scared shitless, because I didn't know who they are or what they wanted. I ran to my door and locked it and went to my kitchen and grabbed a knife. And then I heard a knock at the door. 
I jumped from my seat and went straight to my bedroom and locked it, leaving my computer open and the living room lights on. It was the worst birthday ever. I own this property in the countryside of Alabama. It's in the middle of nowhere with 60 or more acres and it has an abandoned house, barn and greenhouse. The barn and house are close to each other and the greenhouse is far into the woods. Me and my friend were setting up our film equipment in the house because we were going to film a video the next day. We had to sleep over for some reason and I didn't want to sleep in the truck, so we slept inside the house. My friend wakes me up and tells me he's getting a really weird feeling about all this, so we go and sleep in my truck. I fall asleep, and when we get into the truck, my friend is still awake, and he told me that it was around four in the morning, and he saw seven to eight people in hoods and robes. He said they looked around the house for a bit, Probably to see if anyone was there because they saw our equipment in my trunk. One of the guys stares directly at my friend in the car, but my windows are tinted, so the guy has a hard time seeing my friend. The guy stops investigating my truck and goes back with the group. My friend tried to wake me up, but couldn't. The morning came and my friend was still very sleepy from not sleeping at all. We go in the house and check everything. The lights are smashed, papers are burnt, umbrellas are broken, and we found candles around the house. A cat nailed to a wall with a pentagram around it. And I was very shocked by everything. And I wish I was awake. And my friend sounds like he was bloody scared. Previous days, we have found decayed animals. Two dogs, some horses, some cattle, birds and bats, and some kind of hand buried. Since this place was once farmland, I just assumed the previous owners just left the animals to die or something. But I don't know how to explain the bat, the bird and the hand. This stuff was found near the barn and in the barn. So one day we come back to see if there's any more weird shit going on and we find three pigs on crosses near the house. The pigs were decapitated, and the heads were on the ground in front of them. They were wearing makeup, and had wigs sewn into their heads. My friend tells me that he thinks the people he saw last time were the ones who did it. And he was telling me he thought they might be a satanic cult or some other group. Around the crosses and the pigs, some of the ground was burnt in a few large circles and me and my friends spent the rest of our day taking down the pigs and burying them in the woods. We go here again and ride some dirt bikes and ATVs and nothing weird was there when we came. We put the vehicles in the barn because we would come back later in the week and my friends putting up his ATV and tells me he saw a person in the barn just relaxing on some hay, but it was in the dark, in one of those horse or little cattle stalls. My friend stood there for a while to see if it was a person, and the man moved his hand in a goodbye kind of way, and my friend runs out of the barn and tells me what happened. I go in there because I thought my friend was just bullshitting me, and no one's there. Then when I'm leaving the barn, I see the guy trying to sleep on the second story and I ask him if he's alright and he tells me he is and tells me to go away and let him sleep even though it's my property. I don't want to start any shit with him so I let him be. My friend says he thinks he's part of the group that's been doing stuff on my land. We go there about two weeks later and we see from my truck the guy walking out of the barn and talking with two guys. One of them points to my truck, and they all run into the woods. I get my knife and gun, keep it under my seat, and finally it came to use. And I go with my friend to go find the guys and tell them they can't come here anymore, and that it's private property. I can't find them. But we found that most of them 
stay inside the greenhouse. We find clothes, books, dead birds and squirrels, and I'm assuming that's what they ate. There was a pond nearby, so that's probably where they bathed in, if they bathed at all. We go to the barn and investigate it, and we found books on the second story, an altar, and some tall candles. All of this shit was out of sight from the ground, and we also found stuff like ropes, knives, nails, hammers, and a mallet. We conclude that all these guys are in the group, and they did all the weird shit. We've not been back to my property for months. We do not know if they're still there or not. And the police have searched before there for two guys that kidnapped a nine-year-old as well. So those guys might be blamed for that. The police found no one though. I don't think I want to go back, but I might make one final round this Sunday to see if they do anything on the Sabbath. I really hope though that they've left for good. I recently moved in with my partner and we both have a dog each. My dog is my baby and my protector. She lets me know when someone is on my property. That she doesn't know. My partner has just left the country for two weeks and I'm home alone. Tonight I was winding down from a long day of various appointments and about to sit down to a late dinner and a nice glass of wine. I'm in my nighty and getting comfy when there's a knock at the door. It's my neighbor and he seemed very concerned. He said to me, I don't want to alarm you or anything, but I'm pretty sure I saw someone fence hop into your yard. You might want to just pop out there for a second and check on your dogs because they are being unusually quiet. Uh, okay, thanks, I'll check now. Cue me turning on the spotlight and all the back patio lights from my back deck, lighting up the whole backyard. I don't see anyone, but my dog is very agitated and not responding to me calling her. I didn't actually go outside as I'm only a tiny woman and completely defenseless against an attacker. So I quickly close and lock all my doors and ring my mum in a panic. My mum then calls the police, who come around to my place very quickly and investigate the backyard. Nobody was there, but there were signs somebody was there. They were likely casing the place or just cutting through my yard to get to someone else's house. Either way, I was relieved, but very freaked out. All was well until the police went to leave through the side gate. The officers opened the gate and my dog, who knows not to go near it when someone opens and closes it, doesn't usually run away, bolted past the officers and into the road. She wasn't responding to my call and was spooked out, completely out of character. I live on a main road and the moment she ran into the road she got hit by a car going 60. Cue me crying and panicking. We rushed to the vet and thankfully she's okay. But someone tried to break into my house and spook my dog to the point where she nearly died. I really hope they didn't want to make a second trip. About two years ago, I was renting a house with my two friends. The house was incredibly old had a wood stove with no furnace, and was pretty creepy at night. We lived off a dirt road with two or three other houses. So one night, at around three or four in the morning, I woke up to my best friend coming home from work as he worked the night shift. I heard him flushing the toilet and it kind of stirred me out of my sleep. I groggily open my eyes and look around my room. I notice my bedroom door is still closed, but I see a man standing between my bed and the TV. I lived in a pretty small room, so the distance between my bed and the TV 
is maybe three to five feet at most. I keep a fan running throughout the night, between the bed and the TV, just to help me relax at night and stay cool. I look at the guy, and he is just standing there. He's wearing a baseball cap, and it's down kinda low, so I can't really see his face. I notice he's wearing a grey hoodie, with his hands in the pouch, and wearing khaki shorts as well. I blink a few times, and look at him and say, Hey, no response. So thinking it might have been my roommate's friend trying to play a prank on me, I speak to him again. What's up, man? I'm trying to sleep. Get out. He just stands there, hands in the hooded pouch, shifts his weight a little bit, but still stands in the same spot, just looking at me. I get a little freaked out now, after seeing him move slightly. So being the pussy I am, I let out a slight scream and grab my pillow. When I turn back around and swing the pillow at him, the guy vanishes. After sitting there dumbfounded for about five minutes, I realized the guy was standing exactly where my fan sits in the room. All my windows were closed and my door never budged. I was in Awana an evangelical extracurricular like Girl Scouts, but with more Jeebus and less cookies. Badges for memorizing Bible verses instead of whatever they give you badges for in scouting. I don't know, lighting a fire? There was also Baptist school. I'm pretty sure this was technically a non-denominational Christian school, but I remember being really concerned for the soul of one of the Presbyterian kids I knew. So I'm now doubting that. Five days a week, and it was typical school hours. They also had King's Kids, an athletic program, the middle school and high school precursor to the SCA. I don't remember much, except that the kids I knew that stayed involved with this were pretty much out there when I got to high school. There was also the Vacational Bible School. Your kid not getting their full dose of Jesus over the summer? That's okay. We have week-long, eight-hour intensive Jesus camp. Gotta save themselves. Weekly, extracurricular Bible studies were a must. They were always segregated by age and frequently by gender. They were like a subdivided group of youth groups usually around two hours one to two times a week, monthly or so gatherings and only the really holy kids went to these. We also had the youth group like I mentioned, Wednesday and Sunday mornings, before or after church service. It was about two hours long and the typical schedule went like this, praise and worship, you have to sing along, hands in the air and clapping expected and encouraged. Lack thereof reasoning for discussion with parents about how little Bobby and Sally isn't feeling the Lord's spirit. Messages from youth pastors who was in his late twenties and still trying to rock the early nineties because he's a super relevant man. Messages either about not having sex or giving in to temptation or about evangelizing. Occasionally you'd get a really great hellfire and brimstone sermon everyone's favorite which brings us to the call to the altar you'd come forward and symbolically rid yourself of your sins through a metaphorical gimmick write them down and nail them to this cross we made wash your hands in this bucket of water and the really holy kids would help the lost souls find the Lord take them aside pray with them give them a Bible and invite them to Bible studies there was also prayer requests aka the Christian gossip column. Time to tell everyone that you worried about Susie because she thinks her mum might be an alcoholic. 
or Bobby because of his porn addiction, or Mary because she's not a virgin and we need to pray for her sickness. We were then divided into small groups. Adult leaders would take a side who was mentioned in prayer requests, as well as anyone who had an unspoken to pray with them privately. Small groups read and reviewed a principle, which was never fun. And always the reasoning was because the Bible. Until I started college, I don't think I had a friend that wasn't a Baptist. Presbyterians were très amusant, and we did not regard Catholicism, Lutheranism, or any other branches of Christianity as the same religion. I only had one black friend, and her mum worked at my school. She amusingly became the one person I could turn to in my later questioning days. I thought all of this was completely normal. Many of the kids at my church started working at Chick Filler at 14 or 15 to help support their families, and this was considered normal too. Now for the fun stuff. I was raised like this. I bought into it hook, line and sinker. I didn't know any better, but I loved to read, and I loved to ask questions. I was allowed to read anything in my normal school library, except Harry Potter sadly, so I read a lot of encyclopedias. Everything else was biased, censored and useless to me. I could sense there was more, but I had to dig to find it. So dig I did. I started to figure things out. I found questions I couldn't answer. Jesus stopped being the ultimate answer. I wanted facts, cold hard facts. And I started to see the shades of gray on moral issues and of course I started puberty. I ended up dating a fellow youth group leader. We were the perfect power couple for Jeebus. And one thing led to another that wasn't supposed to happen and we had sex. That's right, sex. The youth leader found out about it. He approached me and told me either he'd tell my mother or I would. I told her. She begged me to say I was raped, but I wouldn't. Word spread through the church like wildfire. And at the next church function, I wasn't allowed in and was approached by multiple people praying for my illness. My illness, because I had sex and because I didn't say I was raped. I walked away from the church there and then. I was 15. I lost my friends, my family moved to a different state to hide the shame and I developed a bitter hatred for Christianity. My mum still dragged me to church, but I didn't hear anything but bigoted lies and hypocrisy. i have been out of the house and completely free for two and a half years, and my mum is still a believer, and she fears for my soul. But I fear for her mind. We don't talk about it often, and I'm still not comfortable telling her a lot of things in my life, which is quite sad, really. I worked in the surgery center after hours with one other employee. Tons of weird stuff happened there, but by far the most frightening was the following. We were in the post ops area, shutting things down for the night. My co-worker comes to find me a few rooms down and asks if I just walked by the room that she was in. I say no, that I've been in here for a few minutes, and ask why. She then says she saw someone out of the corner of her eye walk by while humming and wearing scrubs. A few minutes later, we were together and started to walk around out of the post ops area after everything was shut down and all the lights were off. We hear a strange noise, turn around and see the main row of hallway lights turn on. They require a switch and are not motion censored. We kind of freak out and she yells out, okay, who is in here trying to scare us? We then proceed to walk towards the hallway and check all the rooms in it. Nothing. 
So we proceed into the product receiving area and notice that the room and hall had its lights on too. Those are motion activated and we hadn't been in there all night. Those lights turn off after five minutes of no motion. She goes left and I go right towards the exit door that leads to the parking lot. In the door's window, I see the reflection of my co-worker and also the reflection of a woman who is standing and facing the wall right next to my co-worker, literally two feet from her. I freak the hell out and go sprinting back into the post ops area. She follows me screaming, asking what the hell is going on. I told her what I saw and we got the hell out of there. I also had a bathroom door slam shut all by itself in that post ops area and the emergency call button to be engaged with nobody inside. This is a true story. It's about my great grandma. She and my great grandpa both lived their whole lives in a really remote province devoid of electricity. After my great grandpa passed away, she hadn't said a word and remained silent ever since. Anyway, fast forward a few years after my great grandpa's death anniversary. My family went over to visit her so that we can visit my grandpa's grave. The graveyard is nothing like those that we have now. This one had mosses and vines all over the tombstones and was completely surrounded by trees. It was also surrounded by black fences that were just high enough to keep any tiny animals from getting in I suppose. We stayed there plenty much until around midnight when everything was getting sleepy. We then went back to the house which was an old school with a candle and mirrors for lighting to go to sleep. When we get to the house, my great grandma just sat down on her rocking chair in front of my great grandpa's rocking chair by the entrance to the house. She just started rocking it back and forth and my mum went upstairs to get changed. Anyway, she was just rocking back and forth when suddenly she lets out a tiny waspy whisper. I remember hearing the whisper but I wasn't sure what she said exactly. However, I remember the look on my mum's face. She was frozen in terror. My mum later told me that my grandma whispered, Why did you leave me? What I vividly remember was that her eyes were moving as if she was following a person's movements. Walking from upstairs, slowly descending the stairs and then out the door, Anyway, I remember at this point my mum grabbed and then booked it upstairs where she told my dad the story and asked him if we could leave, but he just laughed. A couple of days later, my great grandma was found dead in her bed with a picture of her and my grandpa on their wedding day still clutched in her arms. It was a gift from my great grandpa to my great grandma and in the back of the picture frame it said, I'll never leave you, I'll always be with you, in this life and the next. Now, I've had my fair share of creepy encounters while dealing with the public, but this is one that I will never forget. When I had just graduated high school and was beginning college, I got a job working at a deli clerk at a supermarket. We always had our regulars, the customers that would come in two to three times a week. And most of them were fairly pleasant folk, where I was employed. It was always made abundantly clear to us that customer service was a top priority. With this notion in the back of my mind, coupled with the fact that I was rather timid and afraid of offending people, 
I was an easy target for creepers. Something I have most certainly grown out of. He said his name was Jim. He was an older Italian fellow who got around via his electric wheelchair. Now Jim was a pretty big guy. I distinctly remember him pretty much spiraling out of his wheelchair. His legs looked terrible. I distinctively remember him pretty much spilling out of his wheelchair. His legs looked terrible in a way that you couldn't imagine that he would ever be able to walk. Swollen, red and cracked. He was always describing to me the many surgeries he was undergoing to fix his legs. Now, what's odd is that I don't remember the first time we spoke, nor do I remember when exactly he started coming to the store, only that it was always late at night. But I do remember how weird things got. Since I was hell-bent on being nice, Jim and I would always chat when he came in. He could easily spend 30 to 45 minutes at the deli counter, ordering sliced cheese after sliced cheese, and sampling everything he could get his hands on, just so that he could hang around. I figured that he was just lonely, and eventually he asked me for my phone number. At the time, Declining an offer like this was a foreign concept to me, so I obliged. What a mistake. The texts and calls started rolling in day after day. If he happened to get me on the phone, he would keep me up on the line, up for almost of an hour. I started ignoring his phone calls, which is when he started coming up to the store just to bother me about why I hadn't answered his calls. I would always make excuses like, oh, I was working a double, or I was just out with my boyfriend. One of the remarks I clearly remember him making, mostly due to the fact that it made me remarkably uncomfortable, was right after he had goaded me into giving him some sort of weird half-hug right before he left the deli. Come here and give me a hug. I would ask you for a kiss, but I think we should get to know each other better first, yeah? In my teenage sister's words, swerve, most certainly not, was the thought running through my mind. But I nervously chuckled and slunk behind the deli counter again. My boyfriend at the time thought that my unease was hilarious. He is now my ex. Well, he thought it would be hilarious up until the time he started to notice that Jim was stalking us on our outings. I was in one of those messed up relationships where no one can know that we are dating. I know, and that was a point in my life where I obviously had stellar decision-making skills. So, because of this, my significant other and I always liked our privacy when we had lunch breaks together. There was a furniture store down the street from the supermarket, and we would sit in the back parking lot in his truck and eat lunch, talk, kiss, and whatever. That's when we started to realize that a silver pickup truck kept showing up more and more. I didn't realise who it was until one fine afternoon. Jim decided to get out of the truck and start walking his dog around the parking lot. Yep, you heard that right. The bastard was walking. No wheelchair, no scooter, no cane. My initial reaction was to duck down as far as I could in the seat. But logic told me that this man had been parked there almost every day for the better part of two weeks. And he had obviously already seen me. Some days, he would get out and walk his dog. Other days, 
he would just sit in the driver's seat and stare. I was truly unnerved. Around this time, Jim started making comments to me during conversations, such as, Oh, I see you and your boyfriend over behind the furniture place all the time. What are you guys doing over there? And, you drive that little red Honda, right? At this point, I'm pretty much freaking out. I started having my co-workers walk me to my car after my shift. And I told my significant other that whether he liked it or not, we were going to pick a more public spot if he was going to eat lunch with me. Eventually, I just started avoiding the counter when he would come in. I would hide in the back and do dishes for the 30 minutes it would take him to finally stop asking for me and roll off into the sunset in his electric wheelchair. After a couple of weeks of this, he became more persistent. And one evening I was cleaning up one of the slices up front and he made an appearance. Unfortunately, I wasn't quick enough to duck out before he saw me and he started calling my name. I quickly slid away and my co-worker tried to do damage control while I was hiding somewhere in the back. Presumably, hiding behind the potato salad, behind the walk-in cooler. I would hear his voice booming. I need to talk with Sarah now. I made a quick decision and darted out of the other side of the deli and started power walking to the back of the store towards the double doors that the customers are permitted to enter. Just my luck. He spotted me and started chasing me in his wheelchair, screaming my name. I broke into a run and made a beeline to the back of the store, and he followed me all the way up to the back double doors. Luckily, the stock manager was in the back, and I quickly explained the situation to him. The stock manager politely told him that he was free to shop around, but that it would really be in his best interest not to bother me anymore. This was really the best he could do, since he wasn't authorised to kick anyone out without the store manager's approval. And since he apparently had no other business in the supermarket, Jim promptly left. A couple of weeks later, he returned on Super Bowl Sunday which is one of our busiest days of the year, demanding to speak to me. My store manager was in the deli at the time, helping out, and finally asked him to leave and to stop harassing me. Thankfully, that was the last time I ever saw Roly Poly. I have no idea what his intentions were that night, but I definitely learned an important lesson about handing out my phone number and learned the hard way that being more assertive can really save you from being caught in some sticky situations. I used to work at a gas station that was also a mini mart. At daytime, they'd have two attendants, but the graveyard shift flew solo. I am a bit of an introvert, so long hours alone in the middle of the night suited me just fine. Well, one night, about an hour into my shift, a girl comes into the store. I've never seen her before in my life, but she starts chatting to me. I figure she's probably bored and has nothing else to do. No biggie. That happens pretty regularly. Usually I just smile and nod, and eventually they'll leave. Well, I started getting the impression that she liked me, and honestly the feeling wasn't mutual, so the situation was getting uncomfortable. She explained how she was new in the area, just got out of a bad relationship with a drug addict, and how she wanted to make some new friends. How she had a drug problem herself, and it just kept getting more and more awkward. At one point, She even talked about how much she enjoyed giving blowjobs. Like, what the hell? A customer would show up and I'd excuse myself, and she would sit there and wait for me to be done. I'd tell her that I needed to do some cleaning up, 
hoping that she would get bored and just leave. But she wasn't going away, and I was getting more and more uncomfortable. She never left. She stayed for a whole freaking seven hours, just talking and talking. Finally at 7am, my relief showed up so that I could go home. She tried to give me her phone number, and I pretended to put it in my phone. And she's like, we should date, call me sometime. Huh? No way. I went home in such relief, so glad it was over. Except it wasn't. Two days later, I ran into her again. I had just woken up from my bed and was heading into the kitchen to get some cereal. When I find her sleeping on my couch in the living room, she wakes up and says, Good morning, found you. I come to find out she met my roommate the previous night and invited her to stay the night because she had twisted her ankle and couldn't walk home. About two years ago, my friends and I found out about an abandoned and sane asylum located in Downey, California. Being the curious 17 year olds that we were, we decided it'd be a good idea to go exploring this abandoned facility, just to see what we could find inside. So on a Saturday night, we gathered a few more of our friends and made the drive out to Downey so that we could explore this building for ourselves. After about 30 minutes of driving, we arrive in Downey and made our way through the city to where the asylum is located. The closer we get, the shadier and shadier the neighborhood we're passing through becomes. And after about another 15 minutes of driving, we finally arrive to our destination. We park the car, climb through a hole in the fence, and make our way into the building to see what we could find. To be honest, it started out not being too bad, considering we had about 10 people. We were thinking, what's the worst that can happen to a group of 10 people? So we meander through the building, looking at all the broken furniture scattered through the rooms. The patient files were thrown upon the floor, and we're pretty much just having a good time looking at this weird mental institution. But this is when shit gets strange. As we're walking, we of course had flashlights pointing directly at the hallway, because the power that was once in this building was clearly no longer there. But as we're walking with our flashlights pointing ahead of us, we came to a corner. We see the adjacent wall of the corner light up from what we assume was another flashlight. And sure enough, we turn the corner and there's another group of four kids. Shady, weird kids. We confront each other and ask if we've been to the slide. We politely answer no, because we have no idea what they're talking about. And they tell us that we should follow them. Of course we decline, because we're getting weird vibes from these people. And they're talking amongst themselves. And one of the kids comes up to me, and I kid you not, he has a solid, six-long, inch bowie knife. Isn't this thing cool? Look what I found. He moves the knife closer to my face, and I politely answer with, What a cool find. And we start to back away, telling them that we're going to explore on the roof of the building. Surprisingly, they say all right, turn the corner and continue on their way. All right. Now that that was out of the way, I'm seriously beginning to feel weird about being in this place and about how we're definitely not supposed to be here. So at this point, I say screw it. We need to get to the roof, go down the fire escape and get out of here. So we made our way to the roof and we're sitting there plotting our escape. Like I said, people are not supposed to be in the asylum so they have a police car stationed at the main gate to make sure that no one comes in. So was we're up there trying to figure out the best path out without being noticed by the police. 
That's when my friend sees a fire escape ladder coming down off the higher portion of the roof. And we decide it's probably our best bet. So we grab a small ladder that's able to boost us up onto the higher portion of the roof. And my friend Jonah goes up and immediately turns around. So he could help other people by pulling them down. As I'm getting myself there, my heart sinks. Jonah, did you not see this when you got up here? What the hell are you talking about, man? I look, and he slowly turns to see what was pretty much our worst nightmare. There were 15 people, all hooded, sitting in a circle, surrounding a burning cat, or another dead animal. These people were talking in tongues, and just making noises which seemed satanic. There was an old woman in her 70s. When I first saw her in 1985, she was a chronic schizophrenic by all criteria. The consultant who trained my consultant was a resident in psychiatry as she was admitted the first time. 1943, that is. I found it rather strange that my consultant would never, ever prescribe her any medication. Instead, would treat her as a guest visit whenever she dropped in to have a chat with her friend. My consultant was due to retire, and during one of his last days, I summoned the courage to ask about the old woman. He said, she fulfills every requirement that warrants the diagnosis. Yet, my consultant never ever attempted to admit her or treat her, nor did I. You must never as well. The answer was unexpected. He must have read my complete shock. He took out an old worn file from his cabinet and asked me to read. Pages were yellow, and the ink was fading, but the dates and notes were legible. 1943. His consultant had broken the rule, secured a patient's file, and kept it with him. Then he handed that file and the patient to his student, who was, incidentally, my consultant. As I read, I knew the reason. Back in 1943, whilst in a mental asylum, she had predicted the demise of the Nazis, usage of nuclear bombs, and half of Europe falling under atheist communists, freedom for colonies in Asia and Africa, and the note said that she had systematized delusions and auditory hallucinations that she held to be true and the voice of God. I never saw her after my consultant went into retirement. However, if ever there were a few enigmas that I encountered, she would be the biggest of them all. About four years ago, I went and picked out my very first pendulum. For those of you who don't know, you use it as a device to receive answers from what I believe is my own subconscious, or so I had thought. So I'm using my new oracle. And as I ask questions, it swings one way or another. North to south is no, and east to west is yes. Well, I start to get on a subject that really doesn't pertain to my life. I was asking about someone else's something you're not supposed to do. So it keeps swinging from north to south and then east to west, which I read as not to ask or to ask later. I kept asking, and I got the same result. So I went to bed. 
I remember waking up out of a dead sleep, and creepily enough, I remember the word demon coming to my mind for no real reason, other than my strange wake-up and the eerie dim of light coming through the window of the room. Immediately, my phone starts dialing out to some strange unknown number. It dialed out three times. The second time I knew something was very wrong. And all I could do was lay there and think, shit, as it rang five times for a third call out. After the third call, knock, knock, knock. There was banging on the headboard behind me. All I could do was sit up as fast as I could and, like a reflux, these words left my mouth. God is with me, and God is here to help me. I'm not a religious person, and after that, I turned on the lamp and called my significant other. I checked the phone, and no record of the dialing out was there. And to top it all off, it had been 3 a.m when it happened. I still use my pendulum, but I never stray from my own questions now. I was around seven years old when this happened. Before getting into this story, I wanted to give you a little bit of background information. Since I was born, I've had a lot of sleep problems. I, to this day, still suffer from insomnia. The routine in my house back then used to be I would wake up, eat, and go to school, return, play with my toys, and then watch TV with my mom until I eventually fell asleep, assuming I ever did. I would sometimes fall asleep at random hours because my body just couldn't stay awake much longer. In any case, my older brother would carry me to bed any time I fell asleep, because normally I was passed out on the couch, my mum's bed, or on the carpet by my dollhouse. They never wanted to wake me, since they knew I found it so difficult to get to sleep. Anyway, if my brother was already asleep, then my mum would leave me wherever I fell asleep until my dad would get home which was usually around 2 or 3 a.m., since she didn't have the strength to carry me, but he did. I know any time someone would carry me onto my bed, I would wake up and see them carrying me, but I'd doze off straight away afterwards. I remember it was spring break, so there was no school. I woke up, had breakfast, and spent hours playing with my dollhouse. Fast forward, and it started to get late, so I cuddled my mom on the couch and watched TV with her. I don't remember falling asleep at all, and worst of all, I never even woke up to see anyone carry me to my bed like I normally do. It felt like, from one moment to another, I instantly woke up in my bed, in pitch black darkness. I didn't just lightly wake up, I jolted up from my bed. I struggled to wake up, and felt odd below my waist. I sat up, and threw the covers off me, and that's when I realised I wasn't wearing any pants or underwear. All I had was my shirt, socks, and that was it. At first I laughed, because I figured I pulled down my pants in my sleep, but I never sleepwalk so it would be kind of odd. Then. I felt dread, because it was late, and my dad should be home, and maybe even witnessed me do something embarrassing, but didn't want to wake me. And I went to get up and felt incredibly dizzy, like someone had hit me on the back of the head. I had to grab onto things to get to my door. I opened it, and scanned the hallway up and down. I didn't see where my clothes were, and I was too scared to look further since it was a dark hall, and I was basically naked. 
I closed my door and looked around my room. But I was so dizzy, I just decided to put on a new pair of clothes and lay back down. As soon as I got fully clothed again, I heard a very light scratching on my door. At first I thought I was crazy and misheard it, so I turned around towards the door and walked ever so quietly towards it. I waited for another sound and heard light tapping. I felt a big rush of fear, dread, anxiety, and every horrible emotion possible at that moment. My dizziness instantly went away, and I was fueled with adrenaline. Now, I'm a very logical person, and I have severe anxieties. So I do my best to calm myself down, since I'm easy to set off by the smallest things. I calmed myself down quickly and told myself it was just my dad. Maybe he heard I was awake and came to return my clothes to me. I went to open the door, but something just told me not to go, and the rush of emotions ran back to me, and my heart was racing again when the realization hit me. My dad would never scratch or even knock on my door. He has no manners when it comes to privacy, and he would have probably just said my name and walked in. I know he for sure would have said something other than be quiet. I just knew in my gut that I shouldn't open the door. So I lay there, staring at the door. I even pinched myself because I couldn't believe that this was happening, and I hoped it was a bad dream. But it wasn't. But I knew that it was really not. Someone was at my door in the middle of the night for God knows what reason. And I felt like I stood there for hours. But honestly, I didn't know how much time passed before I felt like it was okay to open my doors. I did very quietly. And when I looked down, there it was. My underwear and pants I originally had on were just lying there in front of my door. It wasn't there when I last checked, and now it was. I grabbed and locked my door, and I tossed the clothes at the edge of my bed and laid there. It must have been the rush of everything, because I fell asleep right away. Once I woke up, I immediately asked my family about it. I started with my brother, asking him if he had carried me to bed last night, and he said he did not, because he had fallen asleep way before me. I asked my mum, but she said she'd left me asleep on the couch, and that leaves my dad. And what my dad said made my blood drain from my body. He told me that when he came home from work, I wasn't on the couch. That means someone took me from my room between the time my mum left me and my dad coming home. I told my dad what had happened that night, but he just said it was a bad dream. I knew it wasn't a dream, and after that I had constant nightmares of what happened. But it was more exaggerated and scarier in my dreams. Also, during that time, it was on the news that kids were getting snatched from their windows. So my dad placed a big gate to block the entire window since it led to the streets. I don't know if it could tie into what happened, but it seemed like information worth adding. This whole thing made sleeping even more challenging for me. A few years passed and I tried to see if I could remember anything prior when I woke up because I always feel like there's something that's blocked in my own memory. I feel like I know what happened, but my mind is protecting me by blocking it. I tried to force myself to remember and it was like something snapped and an extra piece of information was brought back to me. I remember some dark figure above me and tried to get it off me, but I couldn't. It was heavy and the silhouette of a man. Then my memory continues on a weird feeling. I felt below my waist and that made me jump. From there, the rest is super clear from what happened that night. I tried to remember more but it starts hurting my head and brings more nightmares back. I feel like I saw the person's face 
and I know in my gut something bad happened to me. I don't know if I should be grateful if I can't remember it that well or not. Or if I've just tried to resolve it with all the nightmares, hoping that one day it will go away. I always lock my doors when I sleep and block my windows. And I'm also very paranoid of my dad, since he would always be the only person awake. And who's to say he didn't lie me face down when I asked about it? <laughs> 